Welcome to the Wellborn Podcast. We're inviting you to join us on a journey 17 years in the making, which will eventually culminate in the creation of a unique place here in Hampshire. Driven by the vision and passion of a local landowner to create a new thriving community, where alongside 6,000 beautifully designed new homes, the region will be enhanced with accessible green spaces, schools, shops, a technology park, and much, much more and I'm delighted as part of this series to sit down with some of the talented individuals behind bringing the project into reality as visionaries creatives and architects who have combined for a truly unique and one-of-a-kind development and today it brings me much pleasure to welcome Ben Pentreath here to the studio Ben thank you so much for joining us Hi, James. Hi. so your role as the town architect for Wellborn it's a big title with a big responsibility as well. But before we delve into that, I want to go back to where it all begun for you. Yeah. I know you've had a lot of success yeah. in the industry. You've worked on local projects here on the south coast at both Poundbury and Faversham. But where did it begin for you for this passion for beautiful buildings? Uh, that's an interesting question. And I think it, I, if you, I've, I, I have a good friend. He's actually one of the architects at, at the first phase of Wellborn, George Samory Smith. And uh he uh, has a very useful line. He says, you are as an adult who you were as a child. And yeah. it's a kind of interesting thing to remember. And when I look back to, I don't know, like the earliest kind of, you know, some of my earliest memories when I was like five or six. Are you going to mention already, Lego? Well, <laughs> a lot of Lego, a lot of Lego, trust me. And 70s Lego, where you had to be a bit more creative. Um, but actually drawing, drawing buildings mm. the whole time. And uh, I can well remember sort of school science classes when I was seven or eight years old and meant to be plotting kind of temperature graphs or something like that in a yeah. science experiment. Graph paper was fantastic. I could just start drawing houses so on always the graph sketching. paper. So it's always been there and uh, always with a great interest in historical architecture and contemporary architecture. And um, you then sort of go to the next stage of life when I was, I guess, about 15 or 16 years old. And I remember being told by, which is quite ironic in the <laughs> kind of rear view mirror of life that I'm at so far, by a school's careers master who basically said that I wasn't very good at maths or physics. Therefore, I shouldn't be an architect. So you saw that as a uh, challenge almost. I didn't see it as a challenge. I uh, took his advice. I went down a much more historical route and I spent the next 10 years reading, kind of going down the, the route of history. Um, I was at the University of Edinburgh. I did history of art and history of architecture because I still had a passion for mm. all of those old buildings and old places. But tied in with all of that from, you know, all the way through, I was just interested in designing buildings. So I was drawing sketches left, right and centre. I was designing imaginary houses just for fun. It was a bit of a weird thing to do, but I was. I imagine your education and must have been a great foundation It was actually for experimenting, a perfect though, education yeah. for where I've ended up in the world because the one thing that I probably wouldn't have learnt in a, in a, in a British university in the late 80s or early 90s would have been any sense of the sort of living tradition of classical or traditional design, which is after all what Wellborn is all around yeah. and all about, because that simply wasn't being taught at the time. And so in some ways, I, I sort of wonder if I dodged a bit of a bullet. I went from there to work for a fantastic architectural designer based up in Suffolk, Norfolk, in East Anglia, who uh gave me a holiday job and I started drafting in his office and then he gave me a Christmas job and then he gave me a job job and it was a sort of moment when I realized that actually the route which I thought I was going to be traveling down which was just looking after old buildings and restoring old buildings was kind of one facet of life but actually you can have almost a more creative time designing new ones and so that's that's kind of in a nutshell where I am. And, you know, that was about 20 years ago that I set up my own office and it's been a bit of a trip ever since. Sounds like a fantastic yeah. foundation to have you yeah. as part of the Wellborn Projects. And I want to get into those specifics later about yeah. your inspirations, yeah. uh, etc. But before we do, how did you end up as part of Wellborn? 
So that comes through in, a, in, the, in the way that a lot of these things happen uh, in life. There's partly, um, there's just a degree of sort of um, now, I find, kind of personal connectivity between a lot of people who are involved in a lot of different projects in all of these different fields. And um, I think it's true to say that one of the things which is really interesting about the world of, uh, of um, creating new places inspired by traditional uh, placemaking values is that there's actually a huge sense of collaboration between many of the disciplines and all of the architectural practices that there's, it, it's a surprising, um, it's a really nice relationship between lots of friends and colleagues. We're not, we can't all do the same projects. We can't all do every project. And we recognize quite clearly that there's a sort of bigger picture in play. And so one of the projects which we've been working on for many years is um, the development of a, of, a, of a town in the highlands of Scotland, a similar scale as Wellborn. It's going to be about 5,000 units up there, completely new town on a greenfield site for a fantastic long-term committed landowner. So it's a very similar set of circumstances uh, with a very different set of economic challenges um, because... Uh, there isn't the sort of the budget to spend up there that we will ultimately have in Wellborn because houses have to be less expensive because the houses are cheaper, but the build costs are about the same. So there's a kind of, it's a tighter project. But anyway, I've been working away on that one for a long time. And uh, one of the planning consultants who's been highly involved with steering that project all the way through and, and, and exactly the same as here, it, the, the, the planning journey to get you from the original germ of an idea to the moment that we're at now where, um, you know, roads are beginning to be delivered and houses will shortly be coming. It's, it, as I'm sure if you're talking to some of the kind of, uh, well, talking to Mark, the landowner, or to some of the people who've assisted with the planning journey. Or like the infrastructure it's, stuff. That's a, it's I, a, I've been calling it the works before the works can even yeah, begin that you might recognise. The, the, the getting, getting the approvals process okay. uh, is actually quite a gruelling task. It takes a very long time. So the planning consultant who was steering through Tornagrain, the, the, the Highlands town, um, has also been involved here uh, in, in long-term sort of strategic advice to kind of take the whole thing forward. And at a certain point, he um, recommended to the estate here, to, to Buckland, that they came and met us and we met them and have a conversation because there was a very strong strategic kind of outline master plan for, for Wellborn, which had been established for a long period of time. But they were beginning to get to the point where actually it had to move beyond a diagram and into something that was beginning to get a lot more real. And uh, Jonathan Coulson, the, 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 the planning uh, engagement, uh, the, the planning consultant, uh, felt that, you know, he had seen how we were working in Tornagrain with exactly the same circumstance where we inherited a fantastic structural master plan produced by uh, an amazing American master planner, uh, Andres Duani, who's a you know, key, key person in this whole world. And uh, he could see how we were taking that broad strategic kind of outline document and turning it into a real kind of living and breathing place. It's almost like for people that are watching this who are yeah. not so familiar yeah. with these intricacies, yeah. it's almost like taking the theoretical and bringing yeah. it to life, making it practical Correct. And, and we can achieve yeah, this. Exactly. And, and, and in a weird sort of way, you know, in, in this world of kind of urban design and structuring new settlements that we're all engaged with, there's a, you know, there's a massive amount of very, very complex and uh, often quite sort of bureaucratic kind of engagement which you have to proceed through. But actually, at the end of the day, the bit that anybody notices when they first arrive is kind of what does it look like and what does it feel like? And all of that stuff, which is kind of under the surface of drainage, infrastructure, kind of making the trees work, blah, 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 blah. All of that stuff, it's like profoundly important to get it right. But people don't feel that. They don't, they don't see it. Yeah. And so this, this, this interchange between the role of kind of the architectural side and the creation of place is just this sort of fundamental spark. And I, I, I will say, because I've been working in this world for a long time, I've seen a lot of great master plans great outline master plans where the end result delivered on the ground leaves you feeling that you're in a strangely sort of soulless place uh, where something hasn't quite worked. 
And I won't name any names because that would be unkind of me. But it's a really crucial moment to get from the vision into the reality. And that's kind of, in a way, my key role here in the jigsaw puzzle did, uh, is making sure that Mark's vision actually makes it into a physical living kind of breathing reality. Everything you're saying there, you were completely yeah. evoking for me yeah. the word soul of, yeah. of this community. Soul. And even what's yeah. kind of nice or is spirit. when you yeah. talk about the Energy. community of professionals yeah. that you're working with and this idea of trust within yeah. them to enable it to happen. Yeah, yeah. it's so a big you, collaboration. It doesn't, uh, you know, really... Uh, there's a there's a sort of kind of um there's a certain idea of an architect which grew up in particular kind of in the 20th century of the architect as an isolated genius mm. who kind of knows everything i mean this was a myth particularly promulgated by i suppose the most famous modernist architect of all time le corbusier who set himself up as this kind of incredible uh inspirational genius where he had all of the answers. I mean, he even changed his name from whatever it was, Pierre Genere to Le Corbusier. So Le Corbusier, um, you, for those that may yeah, not know that the, individual, the, what would he be he, responsible for? So he, he was um, a profoundly influential leading light in the early modernist movement of architecture. Ironically, it's still called modern architecture, but he was designing about 110 years ago, <laughs> okay. uh, you could argue that these days modernism is just another historical style, which we can draw from if we choose to. We've got um, Ben Pentry nowadays yeah, for modern yeah, architecture. Yeah, thank you. We're all modern. That's <laughs> the, we're all contemporary. It's the one absolutely kind of wonderful rule of life that the only moment in time at which you can exist is right now. Every, true. People often ask me kind of, if you were going to live in a historical area, what would it be? And I'm like, this one. We're yeah. in history. We're part of it. But we are living here right now. We're now all is only what you know for sure, yeah. right? Yeah. And even that, you know, who knows? But um, anyway, so Le Corbusier, he was one of the most famous of the, of the modernist architects who stripped away at the end of the 1930s, 20th century, all sense of traditional detail, traditional materials. They were. It, it was an incredibly exciting moment of life where they were obsessed by the... Um, possibilities suddenly brought by new technologies and new creation, reinforced concrete, which meant that you could suddenly build any form you wanted and it would stand up until that moment in time. All buildings had to be built in a way where the tectonics of the building, which is the, it's the architectural word for what makes things stand up, it's kind of called gravity really, right. uh, hadn't really changed for thousands of years, you know, for five or 10,000 years, for as long as people had been building. They had materials like stone or brick, earth, plaster, uh, and lime mortar to bind all of those materials together. And you had to design a building in a way that it, it had to look like it would stand up because if it didn't look like that, it would actually just fall over. So was, would and, this era be like an inspiration where you'd begin to mass produce then? And it was the first moment of, well, I suppose the first moment of mass production was actually about 50 or 60 years before in the sort of the great age of the Victorian industrial expansions of cities. But, but in the 20th century, new possibilities of material reinforced concrete and large sheets of glass plate glass right. created the possibility for a whole new style of architecture. And at the same time, I mean, I suppose it's true to say that in the aftermath of the First World War and the whole horror that people that have experienced, this idea of sweeping away history and replacing it with something clean and fresh and bright and modern was actually an incredibly intoxicating idea. Corbusier was the main proponent of that vision and it very rapidly spread across the world and of course it had one other little advantage which nudged it along the way in the 20th in the later part of the 20th century it was quite cheap to right build. i was gonna say i thought it would come down to money so there was a bizarre kind of collaboration between obsessed architects who were like kind of religious they, literally it was like a religious cult where you had to understand all of the kind of the rules of the cult. And if you understood, if you'd been taught, and that became the sort of function of an architectural school, was to teach people that kind of the inner myths right. of this kind of elusive... Give them like a stamp of authority. Yeah, you know, and, uh, and you know, you know, don't make a building that the kind of the, the person on the street would like the look of. Um, make something which they don't understand, but I'm the genius and I understand it. So this, this took the world by storm, international modernism, as it's now called. You know, by 1960, 1970, 
uh, we were literally in a world where buildings all over the world, in every single country in the world, uh, you know, wherever you are, you will find buildings that actually basically look the same as one another. Now, um, in a way, if, if, if we then look at kind of what we're on about here at Wellborn, it's trying to just take a moment, pause and reflect on ourselves. Are we going in this? Is, is this the right direction to carry on building? There's a well-born design code, yeah, such, is. isn't there, that, yeah. that, that kind of overlays the, the, the housing providers, yeah. etc. What is that? What identity does the project have for you as the town architect? So one of the things which we've been thinking about in Wellborn a lot is in terms of creating this place that is human scaled, structured, kind of for people to be able to walk around and and um, get everywhere they need on foot and have buildings which feel familiar and which are just naturally lovable, which they which they're going to an environment which is actually dealing with words like, as you said, kind of uh, soul or spirit, or we might we might talk about beauty or local meaning, um, local building traditions, local materials. Um, if you're if you're trying to create that kind of place on a very large scale at a certain amount of speed in the reality of the modern house building industry, which we're all operating in. What you can't do is just sort of flip the clock back to a period. You could take a date of your choice and say, I don't know, we're going to be inspired by Georgian England or pre-Georgian England or whatever it might be. I mean, that inspiration is there for me. But if we just tried to flick that switch, it would be kind of completely meaningless because yeah. we now live with an energy crisis. We live with... Um, modern materials, modern methods of construction, factory production of housing, uh, modern expectations yeah. for plumbing or whatever Wi-Fi. it might be, <laughs> for instance, you know, and so the list goes on. So one of the things you must never do in life is just try and flick a switch back. But the flip side of that is that if you look at history, not as something which is sort of like distinct from us, but as we were saying just now, something which we're sort of part of. So how it got us to where we are now, yeah. And something to be kind of embraced and enjoyed, uh, something to learn from as opposed to something to contrast yourself to, something not to be kind of like frightened of, but something to kind of like look and learn how people did things in the past. One of the things which is a lovely kind of part of my world is to look at those, take the best bits and pieces, look at the problems that people have solved in the past. And I always say to people, if, if there hasn't been somebody who's done something at some stage, which we are today going to copy, it's probably not a very good idea. I like There's that, There's an yeah. obsession in, in um, the world of contemporary culture with originality, original buildings, original design, original art, original creations. Originality takes us back to this sort of genius myth. I'm, an, I'm, I'm a genius and I create originality. I literally am trying to do something which no one has ever done before. Now, that is actually a kind of meaningful exercise at the beginning of the 20th century. But after 100 years of originality and innovation, yeah, of the modern it becomes to become yeah. quite a sort of diminishing game because everything that has been done in the past is still something to be resisted and separated from. So I'm actually somebody who uh, I, I genuinely would prefer not to do something original, but I quite like to work with experience. Some people call it, you know, copying. I've got no problem with copying. Can because, you tell me any like specific yeah. little element? That, I, I particularly want to think about this yeah. idea. You talked about uh, the spirit or the soul, and we've got this idea of stewardship from the mm. top with Mark Thistleway all mm. the way down, and we want to hand that over mm. to the residents, to people that come to Wellborn. Yeah. How is that represented in how you design this town? So, so when you've got all of these challenges of trying to look at the complexities of trying to build something that is rooted in tradition, but is fit for the modern world and is ready for the modern world and is being made in the modern world. One of the, one of the things that we've got to grapple with here is, is making a beautiful place, but at speed and with, with modern materials and mo modern construction. And so 
for me, one of the things which we've really been inspired by is looking at a moment, I mean, looking through history at moments where places have undergone very large, quick expansion in a beautiful way and, and in a way that has endured and lasted. And there are you know, plenty of places that haven't, and there are many, many places that have, that have really stood the test of time, which after all is the most sustainable, you know, there's a huge theme of sustainability, durability, running through the whole of the Wellborn Code. So that the most sustainable building is one which lasts for hundreds of years. You know, that's the most profound thing you can do to, 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 to create a beautiful, long-lasting place. So we've been looking really carefully over history at places which have been built quickly and easily by normal house builders, you know, just like the builders we've got today, and have created a sense of beauty, well-being, um, and durability. And there are sort of two areas where we've settled, which is the, there was a great moment um, just before the First World War in the sort of turn of the, of the last century, 19th to the 20th century, where mass housing was being grappled with, beautiful mass housing was being grappled with really for the first time. We'd been through the whole of the Victorian Industrial Revolution. Cities had grown in an absolutely kind of astonishing rate. Um, but with it came a huge number of kind of problems, poverty, kind of lack of sanitation, proximity to horrific factories that were emitting toxins and yeah. smoke and, you know, all the rest of it. The, you know, the late Victorian cities were a pretty kind of horrific creation that had just bubbled up. No one had planned it. It had just happened. And around about the sort of 1900 era, uh, a whole series, a group of architects and town planners began to look at this and wonder if there was a way to plan things differently. And they created something called the Garden City Movement, which we've been highly inspired by. Because when you go and visit the original garden cities built 100, 110 years ago, they, are, they have all of those qualities that we're, that we're looking for, but they also have the advantage of being able to be built at speed and easily by normal house builders because they are just really nice normal houses that people still love and, you know, have, have really succeeded over time. So we've spent a lot of time looking at that. And the other, uh, and, and one of the beautiful things about the Garden City movement, as I'm sure you've talked with, with Kim Wilkie about, is this incredible infusion of nature, trees, landscape, through the whole structure of, of, of the settlements. Um, one of the um, other sort of great moments of city and town building in Britain was a hundred or so years before that, around about the sort of years 1800 to 1840, like another fantastic moment where huge expansion of cities was happening. Um, we could think of the, the great 18th and 19th century expansion of cities like Liverpool or Edinburgh, uh, Glasgow, um, Bath, uh, very famously big Georgian town. Um, but also on a more local level, you know, so many towns like just up the road is Winchester, which was an old, you know, really ancient town, which suddenly, like all places, had a big population explosion and beautiful street after street of very simple, very beautifully designed, very easy to build and very popular today. Beautiful housing, simple, like, two-story cottages, nothing, nothing complicated about them at all. And so we've been looking carefully at all of these different themes and learning really, really carefully from them, studying them, working out the local patterns of development, what is going to make this place feel rooted here, like belonging right here, not anywhere, and drawing together all of those strands and then creating a sort of fairly detailed but at the same time holistic code that can cope with a, you know a long period of de development with many hands you know who will bring their own skills to the process as we move on through the next 25 years or so you know that's a long time frame um, but we have to put into place a series of rules uh, some of which we're quite stringent about others we're more flexible about rules and ideas and a narrative, which is what's embodied in, in, in the codes as we move forward. So it's, a, it's, kind of like a, it's kind of like a guidebook to the future of, as to now, today, what we want this whole place to look like and, and, and feel like and be like in time. 
Bam. Long answer to your questions. <laughs> I hope I'm answering them all right. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. And your, your passion is oozing out of you when you talk about the project, which is fantastic. Now, the word balance seems really key mm. in this modern mm. garden village experience mm. that people will have within the mm. community. I want to talk about the balance then between mm. you and the landscape architect, Kim Wilkie. I know you've worked together previously. Yeah, what many advantages, times. What advantages does that actually have? And how do you balance that relationship? As Kim, he talked, be <laughs> he talked beautifully about waving his hands across the landscape and mm. beginning to envision and see. How do you balance that against possibly what yours might be slightly more practical and where things are going to go and what are going to be Kim, the cultural Kim, hubs. Kim is uh, pretty practical, actually. Well, <laughs> so how pretty... does it work between the pair uh, of you? Well, no, how it works between the uh, two of us is that I realise that Kim is always right and it's pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> And I have a, so Kim, he's the genius, not you. Oh uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, no. Kim, Kim and I have worked together over many years on many projects of many different scales because um, we've worked together on um, several urban design projects. Uh, one of the one of the first moments where I really I'd known him for a long time, um, but one of the first projects we worked together on was a pretty amazing development in the centre of London in Chelsea Barracks, um, uh, which was a. Uh, an interesting site, um, a lot of controversy at the time um, when um, a big, very bombastic scheme by the late Richard Rogers um, was cancelled by the landowners and a new scheme was brought in which was far more kind of walkable, connecting into the city, into the, into the streets of Chelsea which surround it. And as part of that, Kim was brought in as the strategic landscape designer and uh, came up with one completely stellar vision, which was to create in the heart of this kind of urban development in the middle of in the middle of central London, a productive landscape. And there's a beautiful, huge allotment garden, which he created, which serves, uh, produces food, which serves a restaurant building that I designed at the end of his allotment garden. And literally every morning you go out there and the chefs are snipping kind of vegetable leaves and herbs and taking them in to cook. And that's kind of actually... I mean, you could say it's just a bit of a gesture, but it's actually quite a profound thing to do in a city today. So, uh, to so where did the that. prompts come so, from, though? So, did it start with Kim's idea or your idea? So in that instance, he was there before I got there. Okay. So I was slotting into his landscape master plan. Anyway, that's when we learned that we loved working with each other because we just kind of, I don't know, we, we sort of finish each other's sentences. So it's a beautiful of, we, dance. We know what we're both thinking. It's really, it's actually a really, really wonderful relationship. And it's developed over, over sort of 15 years now. It's been fantastic. Um, and one of the things which I always think is like when we're working together on somebody's like we might be doing a private house together. He's actually genius at citing individual buildings within a landscape as well. So I work with him a lot. And my little trick is to just uh, the only question I ask myself is how long is it going to take for the client to realize that Kim is right? You know, sometimes it's a really easy process. <laughs> sometimes it takes five minutes. Sometimes it might take kind of like five weeks and it's like, OK, mm. <laughs> I'm just watching. Um, we've also worked together very closely um, on the new Duchy of Cornwall project, which you mentioned right at the beginning of this uh, of this conversation in Faversham in yep. Kent, which is a really powerful landscape led. Uh, it's a it's a term that is banded around a lot these days. Everything is landscape led. Actually, very very often, what that means in the world that I'm operating in, the built environment world, is unfortunately in a slightly cynical way right at the end when everything else is finished a landscape architect is uh, brought in to kind of fill in the gaps in between the buildings this is a kind of profoundly disastrous way to plan new settlements mm. and one of the reasons why i think so many people have such a kind of um, negative sense of new development in the countryside it's something that is gonna have to happen if we want to build the houses that people need one of the reasons why people have such a profoundly kind of anxious sense that something is not quite right is actually not quite to do with the buildings. It's to do with how the places have been uh, have have been placed within the landscape. So it's the process that's it's, happened. It sounds like we're doing Kim, something Kim different between got, yourself and Kim. Yeah, he's got an incredibly profound understanding of um, two things for him where it all starts. And I don't want to repeat a, a conversation that you may have already had with him, but topography and water. They're absolutely profoundly linked, kind of like the lie of the land and the flow of water are intrinsically linked. And they are two things that 
a vast amount of development in the whole of the 20th century has completely ignored. Like streets and towns are not, have not been laid out with sympathy to the natural lie of the landscape. And that's why we have so many towns uh, where huge urban expansions have happened. And all you can see is just like houses kind of like running over the hills in an incredibly aggressive and sort of complicated way. So w when we've been working at, at um, Faversham together and again here in Wellborn, like his first understanding is to kind of just understand topography, kind of street networks, how they're stitching together, the water networks. And then from there, this kind of really profound understanding of how landscape needs to needs to be the kind of the lifeblood of a scheme, not the thing that gets bolted on at the end. I know we talked about earlier and so about... so we're the, talking about trees or whatever in Wellborn. It sounds almost like the hugely, harmony that yeah. the land is dictating yeah. your designs the rather than the, just... The buildings, the buildings are the thing that people kind of notice, but actually they're kind of fundamentally one of the less important parts of the place. I mean, one of the things you learn over time is that the thing which lasts forever, if you get it right, is that is the street. You know, streets will last for thousands of years. There are streets in, in the center of London or any old city in Britain which are thousands of years old. The buildings a hundred year, of years old or maybe 10 or 20 years old. You know, the buildings will not all be here in a thousand years. But if you put the street in the right place, the street will be here in a thousand or 5,000 years time. Um, you know, Damascus is the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. It's 11,000 years old. Um, 11,000 years, and the streets are still there in exactly the same place that they have been for the last 11,000 years and will be there for because a long time. The, the, because they intrinsically yeah. understood and had to work with the lie of the land in those days, and we should still be. So so Kim and I have, have got this sort of synergy in in the world of urbanism and you know, master planning, which we're engaged in. Like architecture is the background art. It's, uh, it is trees and landscape and nature and food production that are the absolutely sort of key, key components. And architecture is there as a frame. It's kind of not the big thing. Mm. It's, it's, and it's a, it's a, so, so that relationship is one where, um, uh, it doesn't suit a lot of architects, frankly. Because a lot of architects sort of like to think that they are leaving the permanent thing, but they're actually not. You know, buildings will come and go. That's, that's just what happens. I mean, you hope that they last for a really long time. If they're beautiful, they will last longer than if they're ugly, probably. Yeah, some but, say that man-made has got a bit above itself, above nature, right? And it sounds yeah. like with the Wellborn Project, we're letting nature dictate a part of how this new thriving community it's, is going to stand. It's basically what makes people happy. You know, it's pretty simple. It's actually kind of quite simple. Um, but what's hard is doing simple things. We live in a very complicated world, but to deliver something simple is like really tough. So I just want to end, Ben, with... A question on how mm. do you trust your guts? Because as the town architect for Wellboard, and you've mentioned that you're working within a mm. team of successful mm. professionals, but as an architect, you're an innovator as well. So how, how much do you push back with an idea, with a passion, a specific that you've got, and how much do you take on board, whether it be professional or public pushback against your idea? Mm. That's an interesting question. Um, well... I I do think that your sort of your hunch, your gut feeling as you're talking about it, is actually quite it is an important component. Um I will increasingly find these days that if I'm sort of visiting a new site, and at one stage I was visiting this site for the first time ever, I will I will say to you that um you're, you're quite often making those first visits as part of a very big group of people. It's just kind of in the nature of the world that we live in today, that there are a lot of people involved. And the first time that I'm on a site anywhere, and it could be a site for a new house, one individual new house, or it might be the site for a village extension, or it might be the site like this one, they don't come along very often, of a whole new town. And you're standing in a landscape that you know is going to profoundly change under your influence over the next 
you know, maybe it's a year, maybe it's five years. Stewardship. Maybe, stewardship. <laughs> maybe it's 35 years. And it's a, it's kind of actually a very profound responsibility, if I'm honest. It's a, it's a strange thing to think about. Because it's your legacy and to a certain it, extent. To a well. certain extent, it is. I mean, actually, the the real legacy does actually belong to the people who 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 um, who who bring that group together. Um, and one of the reasons there are so few of these places, like you know, built to the standard or developed to the standard of Wellborn, is that is sadly all too sadly there there is not the structure within the country as a whole of people like Mark who really have this long term view of things. So there I am, I'm standing out in the middle of a field with a group of 20 people. And one of the things which I actually basically have to do at that moment is kind of get quite a far away from everyone else because everyone's chatting about their journey or the road on the, you know, rain on the motorway or whatever it might've been. And I sort of, it is actually a moment of kind of pretty intense concentration where I'm just trying to kind of have a moment and I don't want to sound like the kind of crazy genius but there is a moment where you have to use your sense of imagination to think here we are now what is this place going to be in 50 years time what's it going to be then and and that's a moment which you can only really kind of think about hard once like once you've visited a place once you can never see it for the first time again it's yeah. and it is something where i'm trying to listen to back to that word soul the soul of that place. What's it all about? And in different places, it is about different things. And you have a profoundly different response in Faversham to sites that I've done in Cornwall for the Duchy of Cornwall, or the scheme in Scotland is it has a completely different atmosphere and architectural language. You know, it's sort of like every single place is unique. They're all connected. There's a huge, yep. So, so you are trusting your gut now. How, how dare I trust my gut? What is that all about? What it, what that is, is about experience. And that's what gives you the confidence to go, okay, this is fine. This is right. That's, yeah, that's the right answer. Because what we're not really doing is experimenting with anything. I mean, people talk about Poundbury, which you mentioned earlier, as an experimental town. I suppose it is a, a, an amazing living, breathing experiment of kind of like, what would the world look like if we didn't just build suburban sprawl? So I suppose that was at the time that the former Prince of Wales started that great journey. It was an experiment. And, you know, like all experiments, it's had some amazing successes. It's had some failures. We learn from them all the way through. I think it's incredibly important to recognize failure and to examine kind of what hasn't gone as well as it yeah. could have done. What could go better and why and how do we how do we improve so we spend a lot of time visiting old places and new places and learning from them um but there's no doubt that experience gives you the confidence to trust that sort of weird gut feeling which is listening to the soul of what a place is, is going to come over 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 time um when do i push back when do i not uh, there are certain master planners. I think Leon Creer, who's the incredible master planner of Poundbury, won't mind me uh, teasing him a little bit if I say that he's resigned from Poundbury, I think, four or five times. And amazingly, uh, his clients and patron, the Prince of Wales, every time said, Leo, you're right, you know, come back. We'll do what you say. I um, tend to find that uh, it is better to find solutions than to pick arguments. You know, I'm just a sort of person who doesn't love having arguments with people. And I also tend to realize that you actually have to deal within the modern kind of constraints of bureaucracies and whatever it might be, where to a certain extent you could push back, but you would sort of be wasting your time and your energy. And rather and, than arguments, I'd like to say you're just passionate about yeah, your opinion almost. Yeah, yeah. And it's sort of, but but sometimes there are arguments, you know, there, 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 there can be arguments where... Um, if I can put it like this, this sort of the individual components that go to make up all places are individually important. And if you're a highways officer and your role is to be concerned with, you know, the amount of lux levels falling on a pavement because it's proven over many years that if the lux level is lower, it won't be quite so safe or whatever it may be. Of course you can see why people fight their corner. Um, but there is a sort of sense of being in a silo. And my role often is is having to 
step back from those individual kind of woes and worries and think, okay, what's the holistic picture here? Equality, by the way, which Mark has an astonishing comprehensive vision, you know, like a lot of the other landowners who we're working for, Prince of Wales and Claw, the king included. Um, so that kind of, um, that moment of knowing when to, when to push back, when to say, no, sorry, this is important. Because if we don't do this, it's going to have, you know, a lot of knock-on intentions. I mean, one of, one of my favorite phrases in life is that the road to hell is paved with good intention. Like, you know, great intentions from every quarter can actually create places that make no sense at all. Um, so, yeah, sometimes you have to learn to kind of fight your corner. But I generally find that a, a, a process of persuasion and collaboration and trying to explain to people the bigger picture whether they're members of the public or kind of just interested locals or uh, local authorities or local members or whatever it might be. Actually, most people have got a shared idea that you can build great places. Um, it's just, we've, we've all got to kind of get there. Yeah. Well, Ben Pentreath, it's been an absolute pleasure, not only to see, but feel your passion for your involvement, not yeah, only in architecture there. generally, but your involvement in the Wellborn Project to date. And then, of course, long into the future, we well, hope. I've, as I've well. loved it. Look thank you so coming much back for joining next, us, yeah. Ben. Yeah. And for those of you that have tuned in out there, don't forget you can stay up to date with all developments at the Wellborn Project by heading over to the website at wellborn.co.uk and there'll be regular updates posted across the socials as well. So give us a follow at Wellborn UK. See you soon.